Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks a lot for still being here. Uh, I know that's the last talk in a long, long row of talks, of exciting talks with lots of data, new data, exciting data. And I can promise you at least that you won't get more data in this talk. What I hope to do is to bridge a little bit between different themes that were presented today, starting with Andreas Lüthi's talk, who mentioned already population vector, all the way to uh, Edward's talk. But before I, I do the science, Dietmar had encouraged me to also talk a little bit as an ex-Berliner. And so the, the main person that comes to mind is Uwe Heinemann, whom I also owe quite a bit in my life and career. Um, Uwe was a great scientist that has already been mentioned over and over again. And he also had a very special and very nice and charming humor. <laughs> so I will never forget uh, the plaquette at the entrance to his office that simply said, everybody who walks across this door brings pleasure. Some when they come, some when they leave. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like him, you know, it was not bombastic, it was fine-grained humor. I, I, I liked it very much. And he was instrumental in setting up a whole range of initiatives together with other people in Berlin. For example, the Institute for Theoretical Biology that was like the first cornerstone of using the Berlin is poor but sexy attribute uh, because uh, it helped to get federal funding for hiring three people, Hans-Peter Herzl, who is in the audience, Peter Hammerstein and myself, to come to Berlin and start something new. So that's pretty much 20 years ago. And then, yes, some 10 years ago, the Bernstein Center was funded and like the people that had been hired 10 years earlier, tried to get the next round. And in this next round, folks like Michael Brecht or John Dylan Haynes were hired to Berlin. And I very well remember the good old days in the building, uh, John Dylan Haynes, my two daughters, and here Michael Brecht, you know, you can tell that he's different from these guys. <laughs> Uh, that was the boss of Humboldt University, that Ganten, who was quite successful and, and important, but then also, or, and also uh, important for the Charité as a whole, for the future of the Charité, and uh, in fact, a ministry for uh, yeah, traffic. They were also interested. Uh, federal ministry for traffic, yeah. I should also add a, a little personal memory which connects me intimately to the hiring of Michael. Uh, at that time when we had the search symposium with many, many candidates, at that time uh, when I came home in the evenings, I would tell Luisa, who is now 13 years old, um, I would tell her a little bit about what happens this day and so on. And then she would tell me what she had done. So this was at age three. And I remember vividly that that day she told me blah, 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 blah. And then there was this one sentence that I did not understand. And I tell Luisa, sorry, I don't understand this sentence. She repeats. I still didn't understand what she said. Sorry, I, I don't understand. And then came the sentence I think many of us must have experienced but probably forgot. She said, Papa, I know that I cannot pronounce every word correctly. So I, I was really uh, astounded by this insight of a three-year-old in her own limitations. And when you think about it, it's quite helpful because they grow up in a highly complex world and it's good to know that you can't do everything perfectly. And I think sometimes we lose this ability later on in life. Yeah, and now, again 10 years later, uh, this crowd that came in some 10 years ago that's the next step, and I think this is how Berlin grows. And that's how the spirit, we do things together, has survived. And I must say, maybe I left too early. I followed uh, the advice of my mom, who said, you should leave the party when you think it's best. Nobody stops you to leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so 
maybe I, I, I was wrong in, in thinking that it was already best. Probably I should have left 10 years from now. Anyway, so that's Berlin. It's great to be back, but let's talk about science also. So uh, Edward briefly alluded to the grid cells and I briefly repeat the main properties. If you stick the electrode in medial anterior cortex and record multiple cells, you'll record from cells that are neighboring in the tissue. They will have a similar spatial frequency, similar orientation of the grid pattern, but different spatial phase. And this can be seen by having here three cells. You can shift their firing patterns. Here are only the maxima shown, and if you shift it, you can get them in register, which means same spatial lengths, about the same orientation, but different spatial sh uh, phase. You have to shift them. So that's when you record locally, and then if you go uh, from dorsal to ventral, the grid scale increases in modules. And all of you know that uh, some two years ago, the Nobel Prize was given for this uh, great discovery. And in fact, concerning uh, Edward and Maybrit Moser, the key sentence was that the grid system provides a solution to measuring movement distances and adds a metric to the spatial maps in hippocampus, an internal GPS. I'm not an experimentalist, I'm a theoretician, I'm somebody who looks at data, tries to make sense, tries to question them at the root of mathematics and physics, tries to come up with models. So when I read this metric, that triggered my interest. Is it really a metric? So what happens? The mouse or the rat runs along a line, a straight line, and then it experiences this tuning curves, which I've shown here in a schematic way, and that's one of a few formulas I have to bombard you with to understand this talk. If we want to parameterize these periodic tuning curves, as it's a firing rate, it should be a positive function, and it should also be able to encode both the length scale and also the width. And there is one natural class of functions that are called Farnese's functions, which are essentially a cosine in the exponent of an exponential function. And that allows you to scale for the firing rate, to scale for the uh, length scale, the grid scale, to scale for the tuning widths, and shift the whole pattern to uh, relate to the spatial phase. So this is a very convenient description of firing rate profiles, at least in one dimension. So, is this really a metric? And the, the simple-minded answer is yes, because if you walk along the straight line, well, the cell will be active here, active here, active here, so it allows you to measure distances. But you will immediately realize that that is oversimplified, because nobody tells the rat or mouse to run along this line. If it happened to run along the, oh, this line or that one, the distance between two firing fields would be much larger. And so just by counting in time the spikes, the bouts of spikes, the animal will not know how far it has gone. And it will not know in particular if it returns to the same point. So obviously this simple-minded idea of having a, a grid scale at a single cell level that would allow you to do measurement of distances does not work. So maybe the local group of grid cells helps you. So if we plot them again schematically, the local neighborhood, I said, they have the same scale, the same orientation, and does this help? Well, for encoding spatial location, it certainly does not, because the entire pattern, not only of one grid cell, but of the entire ensemble, repeats periodically. So you cannot know by looking at your grid cell activity from one module, whether you're here or here. For me, as a mathematician, as a physicist, this is a, this is a uh, yeah, riddle, because if you aligned, if you did not align the grid cells in the same way, but if you allowed for rotations from the grid patterns of one cell to the other, you could decode every position uniquely. So why is the grid system done such that all neurons within one module are aligned? If they had random orientations, 
it seemed that the system would operate much better. Why? And sure enough, there's also the question, why grid cells? We have already place cells. What's the advantage of having grid cells for spatial uh, loca uh, localization? So we looked at that first with a simple game. We asked if we had a place cell-like representation of space versus a grid cell-like representation of space, which of these two representations is more efficient? Given the same number of neurons, is it better to invest in a place code or in a grid code? And you can do the mathematics. It's quite cumbersome. I don't go through that. The results are pretty simple. If you have a place code, the error will be half if you double the number of neurons. If you have a grid code, which is such that the grid scale is nested, that is, that the next module has a fixed um, multiplicator of the previous one, then in this situation, the error scales exponentially. So with sufficient number of neurons, you're always better using a nested grid code. And the prediction then would be that indeed there should be a fixed scale ratio. We, this kind of theory did not predict which this number would be, but it should be nested in this way. And indeed, as you all know, that is what has been found by the Mosas. There are modules and they are in this nested way. The scale ratio from module to module is constant. The numbers vary a little bit uh, depending on whose papers you look at. Um, Stenzler has 1.4, Barry has 1.7, but they're somewhere around 1.5. And then you may wonder why. Why 1.5? Why not 10, like in the decimal system? Why not 3 or 4? Why is it 1.5? And I hope that I will be able to give you a simple answer to this rather complicated question. And in order to do so, we need to think about how to read the grid code. So for the rest of the talk, I will assume that there are just grid cells, and I want to investigate how much can we do using grid cells that have these main properties as observed in the experiments. Well, if, and that's rather general, if we want to know our position given the population activity, given the activity of the entire ensemble of, in this case, grid cells, what you need to do is to calculate this so-called posterior. I won't go into the mathematical details. We can do that over a couple of beers or maybe even more beers at the party tonight. What does this really mean, the posterior? But it's this horrible formula. And what you need to do if you want to know what is my most likely position, you have to find the maximum of this function. That's called maximum likelihood decoding. But it is not, it cannot be done in a straightforward way. You have to compute many, many, many possibilities and ask which is the most likely one. So that's the best you can do. Question is, can the biological system do it? And here there is a particular insight from Martin Stemmler, who has been a research associate with me for many times, many years. And I want to emphasize that it is this insight of a mathematician after many months of thinking about the problem that suddenly makes things very, very simple and that could never ever be reached by numerical simulation alone. Sometimes you have to go to theory, to theoretical biology or theoretical neuroscience to make this crucial step of understanding. And I believe that that's what computational neuroscience is all about, das Denken verstehen, using mathematics, using theoretical physics. So I've made a lot of advertisement now, so what, what did I really advertise? <laughs> if you have this von Mises tuning, and if you put it in this pos posterior, it suddenly becomes simple, it's also a von Mises function, and that means that you can decode your position by reading out the population vector of the grid cell activity of this ensemble. What does this mean? Let's say we have a number of grid neurons, let's say 20, all of them have these tuning curves. We are looking at the largest module. 
let's say a couple of neurons spike, neuron spikes stochastically, so maybe this neuron fires three spikes in a certain observation window, this one, two, two, one. The uh, population vector means that you um, put these entries along a circle and then you calculate the circular mean. And this is in fact the most likely position given these spike counts. So the requirement for being able to do that, to do this population vector, where, if you think about it, we have coiled up physical space around a circle that only works if all grid cells within a module have the same wavelengths, if you can wrap them up. But if we do that, we can use the largest module to get a rough estimate of our position, use the next finest module to refine the position and so on. So if we add up all these modules, we can then come to a highly precise posterior estimation of the activity of the position of the animal given this population average. What is the benefit of that? What is the predictions we can do with this kind of model? And I'll talk about 1D for simplicity through a couple of generalizations towards the end of the talk. The first question that we can address and I guess answer with this type of population vector decoding is the question of the scale ratio. Why 1.5? What's so special about it? Well, if you have only a single module, the most likely position, if the animal is at location zero, the most likely con uh, position uh, reconstructed from the spike count is indeed zero. And it falls off to both sides. If we add a second module, and the scale ratio is 3 divided by 2, 1.5, what you see is that the likelihood to make a right estimate increases and the likelihood to make wrong estimates decreases. That's great. That's what you want to have. You want to know better where you are using two modules than just using a single module. This was for this particular scale ratio. If, on the other hand, you went too far, if you uh, put the scales, or if you divide them by two from scale to scale, from module to module, then what you see is you get these side bands. You do improve your estimate, your correct estimate, compare this maximum to this one, but the drawback is that you have these side peaks, and this simply means that you will tend to make large scales errors in your position estimate. So the prediction then would be the scale ratio should not be larger than 1.5. And if we silence the smallest module in the grid system, then the spatial resolution should deteriorate. If, on the other hand, we silence an intermediate module, then we have an effective scale ratio of something like 1.5 times 1.5. It's larger than 2. And that would mean that if we were able to silence an intermediate module, we would expect that the animal makes large-scale errors in navigation. So you just heard from Edward that they are capable of you know, really targeting specific neurons along the dorsoventral uh, axis, and my great hope is that at some day they'll be able to do this experiment, silencing the smallest module versus silencing an intermediate module. So the grid code allows a high precision estimate of your current position. But the grid code allows much more. The animal typically does not only want to know where it is, but it may also want to know where to go. You are interested not only in your position, but you are also interested in knowing where to get out of this room afterwards. So you want to know your egocentric vector from your position to a particular position in the external world. And I'll show you that the grid system, having a periodic representation of space, allows you to do just that in a highly efficient manner. So to do so, let's assume that the animal 
which is sitting right here at this moment, wants to know how far is it to go to the food source or nest. Doesn't want to know its, uh, its allocentric coordinates in the absolute reference frame, but it wants to know how far is it to the food. All it has to do is to shift the origin of the coordinate system from the absolute position to the position of the food source. In this new coordinate system, the allocentric coordinates correspond to the egocentric coordinates to go. How can this be done? And that's where the population vector and this idea of having a circular representation of space comes in quite handy. What you need to do is you have to shift from that point to that. In this circular arrangement, that means that you have to shift by a fixed angle. You can do that by multiplying the activity of all the grid cells within the module with a sinusoidal grating. So what we predict is that somewhere downstream of the entorhinal cortex, there is a region or multiple regions that gets input from the entorhinal cortex and also from a second region that encodes the location of the food or nest and that these two representations interact in a multiplicative way as we know it from gain fields and from other representations where it's necessary to go from one reference frame to another one, from eye-centered coordinates to head-centered coordinates, from head-centered coordinates to body-centered coordinates. This is the same game, and it shows that when you have a periodic representation of space, you can do this task quite easily. I mentioned that you need to have the same grid scale for all neurons within a module in order to run the population vector decoding algorithm. You do exactly the same in 2D, but if you really want to do it, you also have to align the axes because it doesn't help you to have the same scale if they are tilted with respect to each other because then if you project it on X and Y, they do not have the same scale. So in order for the population vector in higher dimensions to work, you need grid alignment. And as beautifully shown, again, in the Stenzola paper, that's what grid cells are. They are aligned within modules, and they are also aligned across modules. I should add, for the theory, it's crucial that they are aligned within modules. It is not necessary that they are aligned across modules but the spatial resolution improves if they are. Finally, let me add with a maybe a historical remark. This idea that grid cells provide a metric had also been questioned, not from a mathematical or theoretical physics point of view, but from a view which in my mind is based on a wrong interpretation of what it means to have a metric. There's a paper by Krupic et al. about a year ago where they argued that if you put the, uh, the animal in a highly elongated environment, you don't see a beautiful grid pattern anymore. It's not beautifully hexagonal as in a square or circular environment. And then the argument goes that because it's not a nice hexagonal pattern anymore, it cannot be a metric. This is similar to arguing that near the North Pole you cannot have a metric because there uh, the uh, spherical coordinate system has uh, this singularity. Sure, you can have a metric. The metric it does not have to be Cartesian. The metric does not have to rely on a hexagonal pattern. It's not the pattern of activity that constitutes a metric per se. It's a combination of the different activity patterns together with a readout that fits with the coding that allows you to have a metric. So this attack, I think, simply doesn't work because it attacks at the wrong level. In fact, as also shown by a paper from Edwards Group from last year, the, this phenomenon that you have stretched elliptic uh, 
uh, firing fields is a very interesting one. If you look at uh, the main axis, so this is a large box, 2.2 2 times 2.2 meters, and what's shown here are the, the ellipticities of all grid cells within a certain region. So here the activity patterns in this left lower corner are uh, analyzed, here those in the middle. And what you can see is that the ellipticity of the grid cell pattern is different depending on where you are in the environment. But the strength of ellipticity is about the same and so you can still, within each of these subparts of the environment, decode the position of the, of the animal, although there are elliptical um, firing fields. Last not least, not everything that is hexagonal must be the result of a grid cell activity. <laughs> and when I was visiting a couple of times, uh, I was staying in this hotel, uh, in Trondheim, uh, it's great because already on the hallway you have hexagonal patterns, in the room you have hexagonal patterns. <laughs> um, I must say that the floor is a bit old by now and so I, I really ask Edward when they redo the floor, they should take into account that when you go from one grid scale outside your room to the next grid scale inside the room, uh, the ratio should not be 10 or so, yeah? It should be 1.5. <laughs> <laughs> so please, when they update the hotel, make, him make sure that they know the correct experimental results and that they do not stick to apparently a decimal system. So in conclusion, I, I hope that I could give you a glimpse, and those that are more interested in can read the paper, that I have given you a glimpse of what a mathematical theory can actually do for understanding. We are always lagging behind experiments by, by years, sometimes by decades. It takes a long time to condense and to come to a hopefully convincing theory. But this insight, this mathematical insight from Martin, that if you have periodic tuning curves that are close to van Mises, then, then suddenly the entire decoding becomes an easy game, a game that could be done by neurons. I think provides insight, especially because there are a number of consequences of new predictions, new in the sense that we do not post-dict with a theory what has already been measured, but that we hopefully give rise to new experiments that will help us to understand the role of grid cells in navigation. I must say I was a bit puzzled by your comment just half an hour ago that there are many other mechanisms to do uh, um, integration across spatial scales, uh, to do spatial navigation. So I hope that there is still a room for grid cells to play an important function in spatial navigation in helping us to understand and that's I think the main point that population vector um, decoding that has been so popular in the motor system, Georgopoulos, or in the cricket wind sensitive system, or in the visual cortex, that this idea of population vector decoding also uh, applies to uh, the entorhinal cortex and allows for a rather versatile representation of space that not only allows you to know where you are, but also where you want to go, and this in fact might be important for you for the next couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.